treatment in migraine. And, and yes, I'm happy for this to be recorded. And look, it's, it's great that the Migraine Association are doing it. Um, the initial treatment management includes non-medication and non-medication. And oftentimes the non-medication um, is as an abuse. Um, and as Deirdre said, my background is in general practice and I worked in this small town in Dunlavin for uh, over 20 years. And then when the opportunity presented it to itself to me to um, upskill in headaches, I was delighted with the opportunity. And um, I was in touch with the Migraine Association and they identified a, a huge need uh, for education for general practitioners. And we'll, we'll touch on that again in a minute. And as Deirdre said, the questions and answers are interspersed throughout the presentation, uh, not at the end, really. So how big is the migraine problem? Well, you know, 95% um, of all headaches is migraine. And that, that means if somebody presents to a general practitioner with a headache, they need to be thinking about migraine before they think about anything else. Um, because it's, it's well-known fact that in the past, and tension headaches and sinus headaches have been diagnosed when in fact they were migraine. Another important feature is that 42% um, of all women have had a migraine attack sometime during their lifetime. For some people, it's only one headache, but for others, it's really a really, really difficult time for them. And it's the highest cause of disability in women between 15 and 49 years of age. And I mean, we all know that this is such an important time in, in somebody's life um, from the teenager to the, um, the, the girl in college and to, to the mother maybe trying to do so many things. I, I just want to come back again to 95% prevalence of all headaches is migraine. And that I'm sure a lot of you can identify with me when I talk about this, about the misdiagnosis. And it is something that I am trying to um, really talk to my own colleagues in general practice about as well. Um, Martin Rutledge reckoned there was um, 750,000 people in Ireland with, with migraine. And that was in 2019. I mean, as you probably all know, he's the headache neurologist, the only headache neurologist in Ireland based in Beaumont Hospital and the Hermitage. And he reckoned that during the pandemic that migraine became more more of a problem um, because the, the lifestyle for some people wasn't wasn't helpful but for other people you know being able when they got a migraine headache being able to decide yes I'll, I'll take a lie down I'll rest for a few minutes and not have the boss breathing over their shoulder that actually proved to be a positive thing during COVID uh, and this is the document that um, that I, I was the lead author on with Martin and Esther and it's available to all general practitioners um, and it's about migraine and we're soon to launch one on non-migraine headaches um, in, in the not too distant future. Um, so, you know, migraine is so common, it's almost as common as back pain and we all know that back pain is fairly common uh, and even depression, migraine is more common than depression, anxiety or falls. So it's a really, and these are international figures. They're not figures from Ireland. You can see it's from the WHO. So the treatment, um, you need to get the diagnosis right before you start treating. And you need to know what you're dealing with. So you have to take a good history. And migraine can be episodic or chronic. And when we say episodic, um, episodic is, is um, less than 15 days per month and chronic is more than 15 days per month. But we'll just move on to this slide. And in fact, this is, um, this is something, this is a, a document or, um, that the um, Migraine Association of Ireland sent to all GPs in the early 1990s, because at that stage they had just started to itemize the details of migraine and differentiate migraine from tension headache and from cluster headache. And, and since that time in 1986, this new daily persistent headache was itemized, uh, but really there wasn't much known about it until the turn of the century. 
medication overuse headache has always been there, but it's certainly um, more of an issue now. It's more defined and it's, there's more known about it. So, you know, when the doctor sees you, the sight, if it's over one eye, or even on both sides, it can be migraine. It can go to the face, the neck, the teeth. And in fact, people have been had trouble uh, maybe even thinking they've had bad teeth. In fact, if you looked at people who've migraine, they've probably had more teeth out and they've made no difference to their facial pain because part of the migraine is, is facial pain. Um, they'll have neck pain as well. And neck pain, we'll touch on it again because neck pain can cause a migraine, but equally neck pain can be um, part of the aura, part of the, you know, the feeling that this headache is coming on, you can get a pain in your neck. And, and migraine classically is, is a throbbing headache. Um, you know, it's a pulsating, but sometimes it can be a tightness and a muzziness. And it's, it's sometimes a little bit difficult. A tension headache is a squeezing or a pressing headache. And there are times when it's difficult if you just go by definition on the tightness. I even had some, somebody recently and he described it very clearly as a tightening of the headache. But the noise, he, 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 the poor Dickens went to the pub and um, was having a couple of drinks. Well, he only had one because really he just couldn't hack the noise. Aggravating factors, vigorous exercise. We have the noise here. Oh yes, this is the photophobia, excuse me, jumping here. Phonophobia, this is the noise and this is smell. And he, the noise really upset him. So even though he was, you know, talking maybe about a squeezing headache and a tightening headache and the tightness is in this one, it really was migraine. And of course, as you all probably know, unfortunately, it can last the best part of three days, whereas tension headache, it goes after a few hours. Um, the frequency of both of them can vary. But the, the physical activity, the fact that you have to sit down and do nothing, you just have to, um, you know, lots of people go to bed. Although I'm finding with the men more recently, the men are more likely to leave the noisy environment and, and just go out, they go outside. They don't like going to bed. But for a lot of women, they really have to go to bed and lie still in the dark room. So for general practitioners, this is an important one, but also for you tonight um, to, to come to it. We'll come to the medication overuse headache shortly, but, but you know, medication overuse headache, it's generally interspersed with episodes of migraine and, and it can be difficult to diagnose. But medication overuse, as opposed to medication overuse headache, is very easy to define. So we were talking that migraine can either be episodic on less than 15 days per month, and you can have you know, low frequency, high frequency, or moderate. And the headache, it's classically, classically on one side, but maybe on both, pulsating, and the pain is moderate to severe, aggravated. We've, we've done this via, by physical activity. Now you have to have at least one of the following, nausea, vomiting, sensitivity to light, sound, or smell. Now, some people get a warning sign. It could be the neck pain, but more people get an aura. And we'll discuss that later. So the difference, as we said, between the episodic and the chronic is the number of days per month that you have a headache. Uh, and with chronic migraine, you have, the headache, you have a headache for more than 15 days per month for three months or longer. And on eight of those 15 days, the headache has to have migraine features. So this is where the difficulty comes in that, you know, you're there with a the headache and you go to the doctor and you start giving them symptoms and they kind of seem a little bit by tension type headache because you're probably having more days of tension type headache than you are having of migraine. But it's really important, you know, if you have more than one type of headache to tell the doctor that. And it's equally important that the doctor will, um, We'll, we'll ask you. It wasn't until uh, 2001 that the definition of chronic migraine included the days with the migraine headache and the days with the tension type headache. And prior to that, a lot of people were diagnosed with chronic tension type headaches and they weren't getting great treatment. So we hope with all these changes that people are getting better treatment. 
So what causes it to change from episodic to chronic? And I really have to say that stress is, has a lot to, to answer for. Because while it's good in some respects to have a little bit of stress in your life, when you have chronic uh, persistent stress, it really is troublesome. And unfortunately, the stress often flows over into other areas, like the comfort eating, the poor sleep, and the reduced exercise. And these things amplify any problem you're going to have with migraine, because these are things we have control over. So we, we need to think about stress. And in fact, Deirdre will be talking later about behavioral therapies to try and help us cope with the stress a little bit better. And you know, if you're not sure if you've had migraine and you're, you're having these headaches and you're not sure, what kind of things, these are the kind of things here that can make it more likely. If you had colic as a baby, um, you know, return, recurrent tummy pains as a child or recurrent vomiting. If you were one of those people who suffers with car sickness or the dreaded hangover headaches in the teens. But if one parent has migraine, their child has a 50% chance of having migraine. And if two parents, their child has a 75% chance. And unfortunately, because migraine is so common, there are lots of people who have two parents who are inclined to have headaches. And even if it's just the occasional headache, it's still enough to make the child, you know, really get in trouble with headaches. So triggers, I, I mean, I know I'm supposed to be talking about treatment, but triggers are also important. And, and we cannot, you know, get, we, we, we have to look at triggers when we're talking about treatment. And, and we mentioned the neck pain before, that it could be a trigger and cause a migraine, or it could be part of the aura before it comes on. And similarly with fatigue, we're just not all the same. And this leads to you know, so many variations within the, the general population. And, and this is a study that was carried out, quite a big study, maybe over 2,000 people. And there again, 80% of triggers in migraine is stress. And if we go to the hormones, it's 65%. And not eating is 60%. So it's not too far off. Weather, well, Always with these things, you need to look at what you can change. And we can think about the stress, the hormone, the not eating, the weather we can't change. And I, I think over the years, we've all been told that cheese, chocolate and red wine, you know, cause migraine. But in fact, it's now considerably proven that they don't, that there are actually cravings that you can get before the headache comes on. So. The, the advice is to take control over the things that we that we can do and that are migraine friendly. So the regular meals and in particular, Anne McGregor, who's an English um, lady who's got a, a huge interest in migraine. She says breakfast at home, you know, <clears throat> avoid the fast carbohydrates with low sugar and go for the good vegetables. I said I'd put up the vegetables here. There's so many good foods, but these are the really good vegetables and they're good for weight loss and they're good for lots of things. They really do help. Um, they may not be what you'd want, but if you keep drink, if you keep eating all the fast sugars with the sweets and the biscuits and the bananas and the white bread, it just doesn't help. It, equally important it is to drink lots of water and to limit tea and coffee so, um, intake, except the only exception is sometimes cola drinks and coffee when you're having an acute headache uh, is useful. And by and large, if you're having a sensible diet with adequate hydration, there's no need for dietary exclusion. Although I have to say some people find certain diets do help. And I'm just putting up the food pyramid here. I mean, I had somebody come to me this morning and they're a migraine or among other things and they they showed me their diet. And I mean, I was so un, I, I was so dumbfounded that they came with the curry and chips and rice that I actually didn't even think to say to them, you know, look at these five servings a day. I, I can't even see you with five servings in the week in this diet. And he considered he was on a good diet. So I think we all probably need to kind of have a little chat with ourselves and look at what we're eating. 
And, and at least we have control over that if we're a migrainer. Um, and the, the things we have control about is going to bed, trying to keep the same hours, even not sleeping in at the weekend. Another thing that happens, people, is they get, they get migraine at the weekend when the stress of the week is over, and sometimes they get a letdown in migraine. The exercise we have control of, and there again, Anne McGregor particularly recommends it early in the morning to keep our melatonin levels up because the sunlight stimulates the melatonin. And, and I've had a few people who can't walk, but even to sit out in the fine weather, you know, even for a short space of time, it's certainly better. And of course, the Migrant Association of Ireland has provides excellent education. But, but so, and sometimes we might benefit from a self-help group or even to share tips and hints with other people who've migrated. But there again, I know I've labored the stress a little bit and particularly the chronic stress, but not all migraine is stress. And I think in, in particular of people getting up early in the morning, uh, maybe taking an early flight to London for a meeting. And, and I had one young lady recently who was, um, you know, trying to work in a different time zone than the one she was living in and, and moving from so many different countries that her migraine just went completely out of the wall. There again, we've had the, the, new, the mothers who've just had a baby and sometimes the fathers who are just up at nighttime with the babies, you know, really feeling the migraine getting worse. And of course, the, night, the, the people who do night duty are working at night. And there again, the nurses come to mind very quickly and I'm sure the healthcare assistants, they're just not able for the night duty by and large. We'll say a few words about hormones because they're an important trigger and we had a question on them. And you can see here in childhood, they're fairly level. And it's the red line in this graph we're looking at. In the teenage years, they're a little bit wobbly. The reproductive years, they're only a slight bit wobbly. But when it comes to the years just before the menopause, they really go haywire. So, you know, the, 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 the teenage girls, I mean, I see a lot of teenage girls whose migraine is difficult to control. And it can be a difficult time for them between body image and, um, you know, getting used to their periods and then the estrogen levels. Um, and then the perimenopausal women, the women just before the menopause, they really suffer quite badly. And then the poor sleep when the estrogen level is fluctuating really adds to the migraine because migraine is, is upset with the hormones and it's upset with the poor sleep. And the treatment in all the, at all these times during a woman's life is to keep the hormones stable. Now, I just want to say one or two words now about menstruation because, you know, everybody comes in and they'd say, oh, it's always a period time. That periods, you know, are really troublesome and worse with the periods. But then when you get them to do the diary, you find, well, it's, it's during the month as well. But there is one type of migraine, the second one there, pure menstrual migraine, which is, you know, only a period time. But my experience has found that, you know, you'll have somebody who has migraine and it won't clearly be that pure menstrual migraine because it's so out of control. And it's only when it gets back when you, when you have some control over that, you actually begin to see the pattern. Yes, it is pure menstrual migraine. And there is treatment for them we, we deal with. But I want to emphasize here that in order to make this diagnosis, you have to have a minimum of three months diary. If you don't have the diary with the days of the headaches, the watch you've taken, really no diagnosis can be made. So the treatment is to stabilize the estrogen hormones and that's normally done with progestogen. Occasionally, there is a different pill you might use. You might be able to use the combined pill and not take your week's break. And in fact, I was talking last night with colleagues and that's an increasing possibility and an increasing license for it. It's not, they've never always been licensed, but there is the possibility it will be licensed shortly. But even without being licensed, it's done, but the, the progestogen only medication is very helpful. Just to say that the progestogen injection can cause a little bit of um, osteoporosis, and that may be something that if you're on it for a long time, you should just get your bones checked. 
I don't want to leave out the men. And there was a, a study at one stage which made the hel headlines saying there was an increased level of estrogen in men. But it was a very small study only involving 17 men with migraines three times a month, which really is not bad, bad migraine. So really, there's not enough evidence to say that men's migraine is associated with high estrogen levels. And internationally, there's no recognition for this phenomenon. So just to finally say, this is a, a very nice little diagram that the Migraine Association did. And it's the buildup of tr triggers. It's never just one thing. You know, it could be the period, and then you have a, a bit of a row at work, you're late home, you miss a meal, and look at, you have a whopper, maybe have a glass of wine. For some people, alcohol does still cause a problem, but it's not, it's not, it does, they're now saying you don't have to avoid red wine all the time, it, because it's really not a trigger. So another question that came in was, what time during a migraine attack should I take acute medication? So it really depends upon the severity of the headache. And we judge headaches on a scale of zero to 10. So if the headache is five or more, a painkiller should be needed. And it needs to be taken within 15 to 20 minutes of the headache starting. So, um, and in fact, this is within the 15 minutes, you could really, this is the time to think about taking the tryptin within the 15 to 20 minutes once the headache starts. But there are a couple of other things you need to get the medication into the right place and in the right dose. Now, Martin Rutledge, who's the headache neurologist, has said, you know, most people get to learn from experience when they're going to have a bad headache and they learn to know when to take the medication. But some people still find it a little bit difficult to predict when the headache is going to be severe. So a few words about the right place, because, yeah, you say, oh, I've taken the tablets, they're in my stomach, I didn't vomit them up, everything is fine. But it's actually not quite as simple as that, because for the drugs to be absorbed into the bloodstream to help you, they need to get into the small intestine. And for some reason, in migraine, the, the stomach slows, um, the emptying of the stomach is slowed with migraine. So oftentimes you need some motilium or some maxillon, both which help to empty the stomach. And both obviously have quite significant side effects. And both of them are used to, to relieve the nausea and the vomiting. And there again, one needs to weigh up the risks and benefits. Um, even though the motilium and the maxillon have side effects, you know, if, they, if you're really in trouble with the migraine, it's probably as wise to take one. And then you need to get the right dose. Because what you really need is you need the maximum power of the drug as close to the start of the migraine attack as possible to prevent it from becoming severe. And there are several over-the-counter medications, and we just look at them now to see if they are the right dose. The first one is sumatriptan 50. But in a, in a 70 kilo person, they may need the 100 milligrams. And the instructions on the sumatriptan over-the-counter box is only for 50 milligrams. Uh, ibuprofen, and this is a very common one, it's only in 200 and 400 mg's. But really, it's generally recognized that 800 mg's is a good starting dose and a, a preferred starting dose for someone, even if they're only 60 kilos. So if you have somebody who's 100 kilos and starting with a headache, they really, the 200 or the 400 is not going to do too much. Paracetamol is okay. And I just wanted to add here about the effervescent aspirin tablets that fizz. And what happens with the fizz is that they dissolve and it speeds up the dissolving process. And you've more, you've more little bits of the drug. So they absorb a lot quicker in the small intestine and it speeds up absorption. So that can be quite a help to things if needs be. You might have a tablet and put it in a fizzy drink or you might use the effervescent aspirin except you must be over 16 for that. Cola drinks contain sugar and caffeine, and they can be useful as the headache starts to give the brain some sugar to feed on. But by and large, we wouldn't recommend them at other times. 
and caffeine can help to boost um, the effects of other medication and help with an acute attack. But other, at other times, keep to a minimum. So this is the medical um, acute treatment plan for four to six days per month. And this was um, initially uh, drawn up with Martin Rutledge and Jane Nelling from the matter. Jane is a clinical nurse specialist. And what they're recommending is that you take all one tablet from all three categories here, a painkiller, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, and a tryptin all together and take an anti-emetic motilium or metotropamide. And while it seems like a lot of stuff, you know, this is what they recommend to hit it hard in the beginning and see will it settle. Um, so what's the best thing to do when you do get a migraine attack? And then again, it, it depends a little bit. Uh, and, and the first thing that came to mind was don't panic. Take a drink of water. Maybe think about a walk. See what the level of the headache is. Is it five or is it less? Back and you'll head to bed. But that's not always possible. And sometimes people don't have the medication into hand. But so it is important to have it in your car or maybe in the proverbial handbag. Um, and really, you, you know, I, I think as well, if at all possible, you need to take a break from work, a break from the screen. You just can't keep at the screen. So if you could take an early break and go to a dark room. And I know lots of offices do help people. I certainly know in some places where they have um, a little room which is less dark and people can go and just see with the headache pass. Because, you know, there is the possibility that you will take something and the migraine will pass and, and maybe you'll be able to get home early. I also think it's really important to have a friend to call on in times like this. And, you know, it's such a help. But I also feel for the secondary school girls who are getting that flurry of migraines as they get a bit bigger. And, you know, they're in the classroom and they get the headache or the science room is the classic one. And then they're brought out into the big hallway where everybody is and there's huge noise and huge lights. And there they are. So if they could only go to a quiet room rather than a noisy hallway, they'd have some chance of recovering. And in fact, I know of one girl who ended up going to hospital and I'm sure if she'd been brought to a quiet room, she would have managed much better. So we had a question about which tryptin works best and, and which mode should we take it. So there's a couple of different ones there. We have the tablet. The Rapinelt is available with Zolmatryptin. The nasal spray is quick acting, but it does cause a nasty taste. And some people find it, you know, it does make the nausea worse. And the injection is great for the sports people. And I think we've had rugby stars who've taken it. So the, the last three will work quicker than the tablet, but really um, they may take a bit of trouble. It may be difficult to tolerate them. Um, and we have a little bit more information. Yes, a long acting tryptin is ideal if, if you feel it's related to your mm, period. So what if they, do, they don't work? Well, about 30% of people don't respond to a tryptin at all. And if you don't respond to one, remember we had six there and I'll show them again to you in a minute. If there's six of them there. So after two treatment failures with a particular treatment, now that is the tryptin has to be taken at the correct time within 15 to 20 minutes of the headache starting in an adequate dose. Then if that hasn't worked, then we would suggest a trial with an alternative tryptin. Um, and again, I know I keep emphasizing this, but it's so important to take it early in the headache phase. <clears throat> now, you don't take them during the aura phase. And we'll come to the aura in a minute. You take them in the headache phase. So this is uh, another question we had. Should I avoid other medications when taking the tryptans? And the answer is clearly no. I'm recommending the, the paracetamol, the non-steroidal, the tryptan. And I'm also advising some motilium or metoclopramide. So that's four things, which really is difficult. And in fact, in America, they currently market naproxen and sumatriptan in the one tablet just for handiness sake. There are two medications that you shouldn't take, but ergotamine being one, which isn't on the market any longer for migraine, and monoamine oxidase inhibitors, very, very seldom used. I can't remember when I saw a patient on it. They're the only two things you shouldn't take. 
So what should you do if you're waking up with a headache? Well, look at you just have to go with the full lot. You don't know what way you are. You can't judge the time, but it's probably worth taking the trip to the person, the non steroidal and the medication for the tummy. Um, so if you're waking with a really bad headache, you probably um, should take them. But really, if the headache is there for a long time, the tryptin may not work. Um, so you can't call that a failure. And Deirdre from the Migraines Association just reminded me tonight that really with the small children, maybe having a bowl of cereal or a bit of toast late at about half an hour or 20 minutes before going to bed, might prevent a migraine in a young child in the morning because you know oftentimes they're too busy in the evening and too busy to eat so just keep that one in mind too so uh trip to use uh, uh with in migraine with aura sorry you now about this um don't know how we can get it trip this is trip to use in migraine with aura so headache is often preceded by visual signs, the zigzag lines, you know, the tunnel vision. Um, in fact, I'll just go ahead here and just show you what I mean. It's just something like that, a shimmering like that. And that's what we call an aura. And it's present in 20 to 30 percent of people with migraine. Um, the aura lasts from five minutes to 60 minutes. Now, most people have a visual aura, but it could affect your speech. It could affect your ability to get the words out, to, to even word find. Um, you could have pins and needles or numbness in your arm or your legs. And when that happens, it's really frightening. Dizziness. Now, this is something that's commonly associated with migraine. And you can either have it for five to 60 minutes or it can last for days on end. If it only lasts from five to 60 minutes, this dizziness is an aura. And, and I'd like to say just, we're not going to deal with vestibular migraine, although we do have a question. Um, dizziness is a funny thing. The dizziness in migraine is often described by people as if they're on a boat and they feel a bit seasick, you know, or that they've had a few drinks without, but they haven't had a few drinks. They're just getting this awful dizziness. It's not like the whole room is spinning around and it can last for days. Another thing they say, they look at a car and they think the car is moving and the car is not moving at all. So it's a kind of a, what the experts call a disequilibrium. Um, so if you have, we, we'll come to vestibular migraine, not in as much detail as you might like, but there's a number of things about vestibular migraine that, we, that, that can be done. So the painkillers do not have any effect on the aura and you avoid the triptans until the aura is over. Mind you, there's nothing stopping you of having the Tripton in your hand, ready to take the minute the aura is over and to drink your water. That is important. So the hemiplegic migraine, that's the migraine where you, you know, you have the pins and needles in your arm and you have the power. Now, just one other thing to say about hemiplegic migraine, it usually lasts from five to 60 minutes, but hemiplegic migraine is a little exception. Sometimes the weakness can last for a few days. Some people are worried they're getting a stroke when they get this hemiplegic migraine. And sometimes the doctors have quite a job trying to decide if they have hemiplegic migraine or if they have a stroke. And this has led to considerable international debate about taking triptans. But many accident and emergency departments in Ireland recommend triptans ad nauseum for hemiplegic migraine. And it is now considered the best international practice when the benefit outweighs the risk. And I've seen it work quite well. I just like to say hemiplegic migraine, you have to look at the lifestyle and really it's so frightening. Maybe you need to think about prevention and there flunarazine or sibilium, if, if you can tolerate it and if it's a suitable medication for you works quite well. And Deirdre again said, they've had quite a bit of success with people who, uh, for physiotherapy, with people who have a specialized interest in hemiplegic migraine. And I'm sure Deirdre would give us the details later. So what if I can't take any of this medication? Well, the ginger tea is always a good one for the nausea, the peppermint teas, and Deirdre spoke there about the essential oils. Uh, you need to review your lifestyle, the diet, the exercise, the sleep. And as so often happens, you're a young mother, 
or you're a young potential mother and you're trying to be superwoman and work and do the dinner and look after the children. And the last thing you think about is yourself. And then like Kate Middleton, you have the hyperemesis gravidarum and really the migraine just wipes you out if you're not careful. Greater occipital nerve block. Um, and, and this is where the greater occipital nerve is. And sometimes if there can be a tenderness there, and sometimes we'd, we'd inject that area and try and hope that the migraine might settle during breastfeeding or pregnancy. <laughs> it can be very effective and work within 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and it can last for weeks to months, and, but it can only be repeated three or four times in your lifetime. I just want to mention the nausea and the vomiting that, uh, and we've, we've already touched on this one here. This is the injection the nasal spray, and the suppositories. Um, the suppositories here, diclofenac or paracetamol. I think if the pain is really bad, diclofenac suppositories are top class <clears throat> and they don't upset the stomach. Morphine, avoid the morphine, uh, the opiate based. And here we include sulfidine as this can lead more quickly to medication overuse and medication overuse headache. Um, you know, if they are they in the ICGP, have they got that document we spoke to earlier? Because there's lots of remedies in that one. So we just talk about the um, medication overuse. If you're taking the sumatriptan or any triptan on 10 or more days per month, or if you're taking sulfidine, tramadol, palexia on 10 or more days per month, or paracetamol, even the humble paracetamol on 15 days or more per month, you're considered to have medication overuse. So really the sulfidine, we're not gone on you taking the sulfidine. Um, from a medical perspective, some people don't like to admit how much they're taking. So, you know, your doctor may quiz you a bit about this, but I, I always think of the wife um, and I, I happened to meet her husband and she said, Nigel, you've loads of migraine. You've loads of paracetamol in the car. Sure, I see the wrappers in the car. You're taking far too much of them. And, and oftentimes this is where you get your clue as a medic. Now we talk about medication overuse headache and how the medication overuse of this can lead to medication overuse headache. <clears throat> What's the difference? Medication overuse describes the behavior where the patients are taking the, pac the, the painkillers often prescribed by non-headache specialist doctors for their headaches for over three months. People with migraine, and, and like that man, often realize they're taking too many painkillers, but they're falsely reassured by non-headache specialists. In fact, I had a woman over 70 recently. She was totally reassured by somebody, but, but in fact, she was right. She shouldn't have been taking the headaches. And in fact, it's not the number of paracetamol you take in the day. It's the number of days in the month that you use them. So if you use just two paracetamol every day in the month, it's worse than taking six paracetamol on four days a month. And medication overuse headache describes the situation where their migraine is worsened by the practice of medication overuse. So you'll well ask how that happens. And this is exactly what happens. They have their headache. They're afraid they'll have another one. So they'll take a few paracetamol and then that will settle it for a while and then the pain will come back and then they're afraid of having another headache and then they take a few more. And then, you know, it kind of keeps going on. And lots of people do realize, yes, that the sulfidine are actually making the headaches worse, but unfortunately not everybody does. And really, that's, that's really not a reflection on the person. It's just a reflection on how we're all so different. Now, when you stop the, the medication, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. So to prevent medication overuse, we need to adopt the lifestyle to help to prevent the migraine coming on. We need to take the painkillers on only four to six days per month. And we need to consider a preventative medication for the underlying migraine headache because our, our headache neurologist in Ireland really feels that medication overuse headache is really purely related to migraine. So the, the hope would be that you'd go on a preventative drug to prevent the headaches coming on. Now, we're really not going to talk about prevention in any depth tonight. We will mention one or two things about it. 
So if you have the medication overuse, how are you going to be treated? Well, just like I've explained to you there, you need to, be, you need to explain to you how it has happened. And you can stop the paracetamol maybe straight away and you will have a withdrawal. And really what you need to do when you're having the withdrawals is sit down and take it easy, drink lots of water, get the fresh air, maybe feel a bit sorry for yourself, <clears throat> try maybe some of the other re relieving measures we've talked about. But a gradual withdrawal is indicated with the sulfonine, the tramadol, the triptans. And usually they last 10 days or more. And sometimes we can give the naproxen uh, for the 10 days to try and get you over the really bad time. Um, and then when, when we've presented you with this information about the medic medication overuse headache, we need to come back then and talk to you again about how to treat the headache acute accurately. And diary keeping, I know you might think, oh, I remember, but really and truly over the years, people really do, they, you just forget from one day to the other. And you know, you have this awful brain fog with migraine and you just can't remember. You just can't think about what's really happening or what did I take? And people, once they get used to me, they clearly admit this. So when would you consider taking preventative treatment in migraine? Well, the experts say if you're having headaches on six to eight days per month, and that's an international recommendation. But I think if I was having headaches on four days per month, I'd be looking for some prevention. And what I find really is that if you look at the person as a whole, there is usually some little bit of preventative medication we can give them to try and stop this. I recently had a girl who was having bad enough headaches and you know, she was told, ah, you're fine. You're only having them four days a month. But really, she wasn't fine. But she did find that when she went on the progesterone only medication, it made such a difference. So if you're in the age group between 18 and 45, you may well need a contraceptive. Um, and, and then you could take the progesterone only pill, which would easily help your migraine. Now, if you're one of those people who's a poor response to acute medications and triptans, you might need a preventative treatment very early. And we come back to it again. We need the diary. We need the diary for you and for the doctor. Because really and truly, if you keep the diary, you will probably see sooner than the doctor what's helping and what's not helping. What about the new migraine specific treatments? That's the CGRPs or the monoclonal antibodies. There's a lot of hype about it. <coughs> Um, a third will get a significant improvement, a third will get a modest improvement, and a third will get no improvement. But if you want to, um, if, you, if you're thinking that, oh, I definitely need this new treatment, you must have chronic migraine headache on more than 15 days per month, and you must have tried three different preventative medications at the maximum tolerated dose for at least three months. So, um, there, it's a, it's, it, that's really important. And your doctor, if they're going to prescribe this for you, they have to know the three different preventatives and they have to know why they didn't work and if you had side effects. Um, the National Center for Pharmacokinetics have approved a managed access program in Ireland for erenumab and for nasumab. I think for nasumab is known as Anjovi but they can only be prescribed by specific HSE approved prescribers. And currently they're all neurologists, not even people like myself, a GP with an extended role in headache. Uh, so this, I just want to talk about diaries and the Migrant Association have been to the fore with diaries as well. And, and you can see the things you need. Um, uh, the Anjovi one is probably different. You want the symptoms, you want the acute medications, the time to headache relief, if the tryptin is going to work, it will work within two hours. And if you've ever been involved with a clinical trial for migraine, they're looking at headache relief within two hours. And then you'll have your possible triggers. And you could possibly write down here, busy day at work, you know, rain came at the wrong time. You know, it's a really good way to do it. Now, migraine buddy, the young people love the migraine buddy and they find that they learn lots from it. And it kind of prompts them about what's going on. So, you know, it's, it's pretty good. But, you know, all too often when I ask for a diary, this is all I get. And then sometimes I get this and 
and this is okay like sometimes you don't get to write it down and sometimes you don't you know there it isn't difficult it is difficult to write it down but I think you have to try and keep writing it down somewhere or other along the line uh, we had a question there about dizziness and I mentioned the dizziness um earlier that if the dizziness is part of the aura uh it lasts less than 60 minutes but if you have vestibular migraine that's a different thing and it's the same routine you want the sensible lifestyle the, you, you there's a couple of different preventatives and you must take the preventatives for at least three months but vestibular rehabilitation with a physio whose special expertise is often really useful however if none of those things are making any progress then a referral to an ENT specialist for vestibular and hearing tests and maybe some further tests would be indicated. Uh, and then we had this poor girl, and I think you probably know the, the answer to all these now. She's taking pisotrophen for a month. And I see another question about a little girl. Pisotrophen is a very good drug for small children. Uh, and I'm talking as young as six and seven. And I think it's important to give them something even if they're very small, because it's awful. Um, she's all she's getting is a better night's sleep and and really migraine is judged over three months now you might increase the dose of pisotrophen before the three months but the fact that she's getting a little bit more sleep with the pisotrophen is good now she is really taking um you know too many frovex she's taking them almost every second day so she's taking them on 15 days per month so she's not well controlled so i mean I, you'd have to talk to that little girl about her breakfast and her diet and what she's having. And I know that ch children can be quite fuddy and quite fussy and they don't like this and they don't like that. But really, we have to lay it on the line that this is a difficult illness. And really, we have to get you to do what's right to try and get you a bit better. It's awful she's missing so many days from school. <laughs> it's really awful. And as I said, the science room, uh, there's where we go back to the triggers. Uh, I know there was one, you know, if they maybe just went to school and didn't do the homework, or maybe if they did one subject and they just did their favorite subject, or maybe if they just did seven subjects. Um, and for leaving cert, I'm sure those of you who have children in school probably know that you can get an accommodation for the leaving cert. If you if you have somebody who's got bad migraine and you talk to your neurologist, they can fill up a form to help you with, with um, educational needs at that very vulnerable time in the life. I always like to just include this from Ray Forbes that migraine on a budget because a lot of migraine treatment is expensive. <clears throat> and, and you know, it's, it's the same as Mar Maria Murray in the migraine book. It's good, sensible exercise, relaxation, lots of water, keep <coughs> the medication to hand and try not to fear the pain. And another resource which I have found very good is the migraine, the World Migraine Summit. And they have really useful documents. And this girl was talking about, everyone was telling her about lifestyle and she was saying, ah, here, come on, look at it, it's not that important. But she really had to kind of look at the food, and look at what was happening. And she's so delighted that she did. Um, and just to remind you about this document that maybe your GP will have, it's the migraine diagnosis and management, which deals with um, uh, the treatment of migraine, which is available for, from the Irish College of General Practitioners. All that's left for me to do is to thank you for your attention. I hope it's been helpful. And if you have questions or comments or you want to find out a bit more about me, I have a website there. And thank you again to the Migraine Association for, for having me here tonight. <clears throat> okay, dear.